Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Holy Lord, Father Almighty, Eternal God, for the sake of your generosity and that of your Son, who endures suffering and death for me, for the sake of the wonderful holiness of his mother and the merits of all saints, grant to me, a sinner unworthy of your blessings, that I may love you alone and ever thirst for your love. Let me ever have in my heart remembrance of the benefits of the passion. May I recognize my own sinfulness and desire to be humbled and be Christianated by all. But let nothing grieve me except sin. Amen. 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 Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That was well done. I've learned from the best. Thank you very much. <laughs> mm, that's open for discussion. Uh, yeah. Um, anyway. You know I meant you, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. That's, yeah. Check. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a terrible judge of my own performance. Okay, everybody yeah. does. So that's why I have to ask other people. Did that make any sense? <laughs> Always does. Uh, should we start off all of our gatherings the way we did this evening by ten minutes of raucous laughter and I love it. Uh, I like vacuous it. commentary. I love it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You know how I start my classes. So. Okay. Good. Um, <laughs> okay. The topic on the uh, syllabus for tonight is priesthood, and I immediately got bombarded with uh, questions about. Uh, Holy Week and so I had to say uh, it, the syllabus says priesthood doesn't say anything about Holy Week so I brought you stuff on Holy Week um, really important uh, it's the most important week of the year celebrating the most important things since creation and the most important person who has ever come into this world. Um, and so uh, the more you know, the better able you are to prepare for, for what's going to happen to you on, in Holy Week and uh, why that's important. Um, so read up and uh, amaze your friends, confound your enemies, uh, have answers to what's going to happen. and. Um, uh, I don't know who's following me, but you can uh, enable them to fall down at your erudition, uh, if, um, which is a good thing. Uh, priesthood. It's really important to remember this one thing, that priesthood is primarily the only reason why there are priests in any religion at any time is about sacrifice. Sacrifice has existed for thousands of years. Sacrifice is a part of hundreds of thousands of different faith experiences by millions and millions of people across the millennia. Uh, wherever people employ sacrifice as a form of worship, unlike Jimmy Swaggart, who employs entertainment as a form of worship. But for those who focus on sacrifice, there are always and inevitably three things that need to be present. Number one is a priest. The priest supervises the sacrifice. The priest directs how it unfolds. The priest describes the reasons for doing this. And the priest describes the results of sacrifice. So the first requirement for a sacrifice is a priest. And in countless societies, 
uh, priests or shamans or medicine men or uh, whatever they're called, witch doctors, whatever they're called, usually are hereditary. The craft is passed on from father to son or mother to daughter, as the case may be. Our concern is about the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the second thing we need is an altar, a focus. Altars have become, uh, be in almost all over the world, the focus of worship. This is where the sacrifice takes place. This is where the divinity and humanity are united. The altar is the nexus of heaven and earth. Not just in Christianity, not just in Judaism, but in every religion that employs sacrifice. So the altar itself is not just a location, like the utility island in your kitchen. Uh, it is the focus of worship where the divine and the human come together. And the third element that is absolutely required is a victim. The victim takes the place of the votary because in all sacrificial systems the victim in the sacrifice should be the votary, him or herself. This expresses the total devotion of the individual to the God. Now, the most famous of these are the human sacrifices by the Aztecs and other Central American people and South American people where they employed human sacrifice but even then this was not the sacrifice of the worshiper him or herself these were substitutes usually captured in war or slaves who took the place of the votaries in this immolation experience this death because the highest gift that people perceive that they can give to God is the gift that comes from God, and that is life. And so these three things, the priest, the altar, and the victim are essential for sacrifice. And how they are defined <clears throat> is as varied as the experience of human beings across millennia. But for us, we're going to concentrate on two experiences, Old Testament, New Testament, the experience of Israel and the experience of Christianity. Let's look at the Old Testament. Father has to stand up. Father is old. In the Old Testament, you'll find that the patriarchs, the earliest ancestors, performed sacrifices themselves. That the head of the clan was considered to have a priestly role. And so Cain, or Adam, Cain, Abel, Noah, conducted sacrifices. And when God made a covenant with Abraham, one of the experiences of divine intimacy, the invitation to trust, was when God ordered Abraham to go into the land of Nod, or no, into the land of Shinar. No, that was the Tower of Babel, 
ordered Abraham to leave his home and take his son Isaac, his only son, and to make him a holocaust, a sacrificial victim. Now you can imagine the anxiety and grief of Abraham walking along with his son Isaac right next to him going into a foreign territory in order to offer this child up as a sacrifice. And Abraham told Isaac that this is the purpose of their journey. They're going to offer sacrifice to the God of Abraham. And when they get there, Isaac is old enough to say, well, Father, we have no victim. And it's then that it dawns on Isaac that he is the victim. And so assembling wood on the altar in order to burn up, a holocaust is a burnt offering, to burn up this victim. The angel of the Lord intervenes and tells Abraham, don't do this. God understands now your total commitment. So we find in the Old Testament, especially with the patriarchs, all the way up to Jacob himself and his 12 sons, that the head of the clan performs the sacrifice. And invariably, as in most sacrificial experiences, animals are the source of the life that is handed back to the deity. And so animal sacrifice is the primary form of sacrifice in the Old Testament. Uh, there were all kinds of animal victims. Uh, but for those who could not afford animal victims, uh, pro the offerings of produce, cereal, fruits, grain, uh, wine, uh, incense were acceptable. They were all burnt up on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. For when Israel conquered Canaan, and the, the temple was built in Jerusalem, the altar was directly in front of the Holy of Holies. And it was big, about the size of this room. And it was burning constantly, consuming animal victims brought forward by, uh, for sacrifice. So after the covenant, of Moses, after the Sinai experience, all of this is codified in the first five books of the Bible called the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. And the Mosaic Covenant directs that priests can only be lineal descendants of Jacob's son, Levi. The sons of Levi become the priests of the temple. And it is their primary responsibility to offer sacrifice. And only the Levites may do this. Secondly, there's only one altar when Israel enters Canaan. And that is the altar at the temple in Jerusalem. Now with the revolt of the 10 tribes in the north against the two tribes in the south by Rehoboam, he established a temple and an altar of sacrifice at Samaria. These are the Samaritans that you read about in the New Testament. And the conflict between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah with its capital at Jerusalem was always focused on the true altar of God in the temple at Jerusalem 
and the rebel temple of God at Samaria and the conflict between the two. Finally, the victims, clean animals, animals which the Mosaic Covenant had declared to be clean, acceptable sacrifices, and acceptable food. And a lot of time is spent on describing the things that are considered clean and unclean. Cows were considered clean. Steers, bulls, they were considered clean. Pigs were unclean. Shellfish were unclean. Regular fish, Piscean, if we want to go down to the, what is it, the Janus, um, they were acceptable, but not shellfish. Um, so only clean animals could be brought. Produce, incense, no human victims. Human sacrifice forbidden, abhorrent, forbidden by the law. And so the priesthood of the Old Testament was focused primarily on the sacrificial act. There was very little about the responsibility of the sons of Levi to instruct the people. Very little in the law of Moses about how everything else in the law was to be applied. This was left to the scribes. They read the law. They copied the law. And they were called upon to interpret the law. And one of the things that happened about a hundred years before the time of Jesus was the uh, arrival of a new movement of spirituality of a popular movement in how to live out this covenant love better these were called the Pharisees and they had a really good idea that personal holiness is as important or more important than the sacrifices at the temple. And this was a groundbreaking movement in Israel. Unfortunately, by the time of Jesus, the Pharisees uh, let it go to their heads. And they looked upon people who were not working their form of obedience to the law as basically lost. This is why shepherds were considered among the lowest realm of society because not only were they unlettered, they couldn't read the law. Number two, they lived out among the sheep and couldn't observe the law. And thirdly, they were far away from the sacrifice of the temple up in the hills. Um, that's why when Jesus Christ was born, the first announcement of the word made flesh was made to the lowest sector of society, the shepherd. Something new takes place. Who is this Jesus? He is the supreme high priest, the supreme prophet, and the supreme king. Why? Because he is God. The eternal word takes on flesh in Jesus Christ. All of these roles that were so important, not only in world religion, but especially in Israel, are now focused in one person. 
descended from David, not from Levi. Descended from a king who was also a prophet. And so Jesus begins a new form of priesthood and sacrifice. Firstly, priests that Jesus will choose are not chosen from one um, hereditary line. They are chosen from among the people they will be sent to serve. And they are chosen not only from the people, but chosen by the people with the approval of the apostles and their successors, who are the bishops. Secondly, the altar. There's more than one altar, as you may have noticed. Uh, why? Because the altar is established wherever a congregation is established with a bishop, one of the successors of the holy apostles themselves. And so the sacrifice is governed by the high priest, who is the bishop, who is empowered to ordain men who will be able to offer the sacrifice where the bishop cannot be. That's what I am. I am ordained, in other words, specifically designated to perform specific roles that are proper to the bishop. The bishop is the high priest, successor of the apostles. He designates candidates from among the people who are going to be served by these presbyters or priests that he ordains orders to specific roles and only those roles and one of them is to offer sacrifice mm -hmm. number three the only sacrificial gifts that are offered are those of Melchizedek the Old Testament priest and king of Salem who accepted booty from Abraham as he went to war against the Canaanites. Salem has been identified with Jerusalem. Salem is shalom. Salam. It's the word peace. And so the Old Testament king of Salem, Melchizedek, offered bread and wine in thanksgiving to God for Abraham's victory. And these are the same gifts, bread and wine, which the Lord Jesus offered at the Last Supper. When he said, do this in remembrance of me. For this is my body, and this is my blood. Jesus is at once priest, altar, and victim. So there will be no more bloody animal sacrifices. Instead, the sacrifice of Melchizedek, the sacrifice of Jesus himself, will be offered. One of the really neat things about the New Testament is that it came to be over a period of time. The earliest gospel we have is Mark. And Luke and Matthew are synoptic with Mark. In other words, synopsis. It's a synopsis of events over a period of time. And included in Matthew and Mark and Luke are what's called the institution narratives, the story of the Last Supper, when Jesus tells his disciples to take bread and wine 
and offer them in remembrance of him, not in terms of recollection of a past event, but to remember that he is present. So when we hear the words, do this in remembrance of me, it is to call to their attention that he is present in the room. And to prove that, by the late 80s AD, the Gospel of John is written. In John's Gospel, there is no narrative of the institution at the Last Supper. Instead, the important event is the foot washing. Where does John talk about sacrifice? Where does he talk about priest, victim, and altar? Where does he talk about what this bread and wine is supposed to be? His sixth chapter. An entire chapter that tells us not only what the understanding of John's community near the end of the first century was about priesthood and sacrifice, tells anybody who picks up the New Testament what this sacrifice is. And John is explicit. I read part of the sixth chapter of John's Gospel at this morning's funeral for a church full of non-practicing Catholics. And in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus speaks about himself as the bread of life. And it's important to see him say these words. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. You can just see him doing that. This is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Unlike your ancestors who ate manna in the wilderness and died nonetheless, whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews go crazy. Never human victims in sacrifice. John writes, how can this man give us his, his flesh to eat? We don't do that. Jesus says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh, verse 55, for my flesh is real food. Now, Think about your marketing habits. When you go to the meat counter at Giant Eagle, do you ask for a leg of woman? No. Do you ask for, oh, let me have a man's bicep, make it nice and big Mr. Universe kind of bicep. Arnold Schwarzenegger. No. Human beings are not real food for us. How about bread? Is bread real food for us? Yes. How about beverages? Do you go to Oh, I don't know, the hematology lab at the hospital and ask for, you know, a couple, a couple pints of O positive uh, or AB negative, if you really want to go to the top shelf. Um, no, but wine is true drink for us. And we're talking about making the substance 
what makes this what it is into something else, though the appearance is retained. And when Jesus says, whoever eats this bread will live forever, he's talking about a particular kind of bread. He's talking about the bread that is offered in sacrifice, where we invite the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Father, to transform the substance while preserving the appearance of ordinary food. This is the understanding of St. John when he wrote his gospel. This is the understanding of the church for 1,988 years. The Lord Jesus was foolish if he commanded that we should eat his flesh and drink his blood if he gave us no means of being able to do that. And so he did. In the Last Supper narratives in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus tells us how we do this. But in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, he tells us what it is. And that is why when we approach the Eucharistic minister, the Eucharistic minister holds up the consecrated bread, the bread that has been set aside for this purpose, and says the body of Christ. And we confess that this is not only possible, but necessary. And we say, amen. What is too wonderful for God to accomplish? Now, in the Middle Ages, there were Eucharistic controversies that came to a head during the Reformation, where people like Zwingli and Calvin and John Knox um, all said that the presence of Christ in the Eucharist is purely spiritual that the elements, the bread and wine, uh, do not have any worth in themselves. It's a spiritual experience. That's not what Jesus said. <laughs> if the Gospels have any use, it is to make it clear that less than 40 years after the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven. This was the understanding of the apostolic church. What does St. Paul say? Whoever eats and drinks unworthily is guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Seems like John and St. Paul are on the same page here. It's good enough for them. It's good enough for me. Priests are the ones who basically are leaders of prayer, supervisors of the sacrament. The ones, the sacrifice, are responsible for the focus in bringing people together for what the Council of Trent calls the supreme act of Christian worship. All of this depends upon the people's concept of their participation in the priesthood of Christ. We are called a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, a prophetic presence, which means that The priest cannot do anything independently of the priestly people. Uh, that 
I depend on having a congregation. We both have a role here. We're both important. This is not something that I do for you. This is something we do together. And so it isn't just a question of having a stake or power here. It has everything to do with what St. Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians when he describes the church as the body of Christ. Not composed only of priests and bishops and deacons. Everybody who is baptized has a role in this body and is called to be active and alive. How do we do this? We take nourishment. What is our nourishment as the body of Christ? The flesh and blood of the Lord. John 6, 55. My flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. And I remember watching... Uh, one of Father, uh, Bishop Barron's wonderful uh, productions. And uh, there was a nun who was uh, meeting with some Protestants about uh, the Eucharist. And um, they got down to John 6. And uh, Protestants very seldom hear anything about the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. Because officially, they do not believe that this is the flesh and blood of the Lord. It's only a, a symbol. And Sister was asked, well, why do you believe in this real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? And Sister said, because Jesus said so. And the burden then is upon those who deny that this is the flesh and blood of the Lord Jesus. You know, think about it. What kind of food does you any good? Talk to any nutritionist and ask them whether <laughs> a porterhouse steak is as good for you as an empty plate when you are told that the steak is spiritually present. How about a cob salad? Which is more nourishing for you? A cob salad or an empty plate where you are told that this is a spiritual salad? Doesn't wash. If and it basically says that the Lord Jesus is incapable of making this happen. Whoa. I don't want to be in the shoes of anybody who denies that this is impossible. Mm -mm. So priesthood is primarily about sacrifice. But it's also about that other thing that took place in the century before Jesus uh, was born. And that is personal holiness. You know, the, the idea that ordinary people could be holy, the idea that this was not just for the saints of old, that if we follow the way of holiness that Christ has taught us, we too can become holy. And the Lord Jesus has given us sacraments to nourish us in this pursuit of holiness, the imitation of Christ. And as any nutritionist will tell you, you are what you eat. And if you want to be holy, you must eat a diet that will bring you holiness. 
here it is. Um, it's better than succotash, which is my favorite vegetable combination. All nourishing. And it's not just something that is done for you. All of this is done in conjunction with our identity in baptism of being uh, a kingly people, a holy people, a priestly people, a people set apart. And this is how the Lord Jesus accomplishes this. And so it's not a hierarchy of importance at all. It's a hierarchy of function. You know, the, the pre... Uh, boy, long time ago. God, I'm old. Uh, about 10 years ago. No, longer. 12 years ago. Um, I went to the seminary to help with confessions with uh, of the seminarians uh, who were there at the time and afterwards we had dinner together and there was about 12 of us or this big round table and the topic of conversation was father what do I need what's the most important thing I need to have if I'm going to be a successful priest do I need to be a spellbinding preacher do I need to be renowned for holiness? Do I need to be the friend of youth? Do I need to be a companion to the elderly? Do I need to be a financial wizard? Uh, do I need to be an expert in canon law? Uh, do I need to be uh, a revelation in the interp interpretation of scripture? You know, and all of these things. And I said, well, all of them are important. But the most important thing you need is to be interesting. If we look at the New Testament, the Lord Jesus, first and foremost, was interesting. And he had only two tools to work with, attraction and persuasion. And I said, you have to be interesting. If you can't make an initial impact, you can't get your foot in the door to bring in your message, it's in vain. One of the reasons why I think all seminarians should spend at least a year apprenticed to bartenders. Yeah, think about it. People have all sorts of, a of access to the product. But many of them choose to go to a bar because they find the enjoyment of the product is amplified by the personality of the bartender. That the bartender becomes more than just a dispenser of the product. And very often the bartender becomes a confidant, a friend a dispenser of wise counsel and sage advice. Why? Because, first of all, alcohol makes you vulnerable. And a bartender then is more than just a dispenser of the product. A bartender then has moral responsibility here to deal with vulnerable people. It's the bartender's responsibility to make sure that an Uber takes this drunk home. Yeah. It's the bartender's responsibility not to gratify what the, bar, what the customer believes, but to offer alternatives, other options, to be an idea. And one of the responsibilities of the bartender is to make sure that the person, that the customer gets off the bar stool and does something about it. 
So after two years of bartending in college, working my way through my junior and senior year when I entered the seminary and went for my entry interview and the rector of the seminary put his arms be behind his head and leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes and said, what value has your experience as a bartender in the pastoral ministry, to the pastoral ministry? And without hesitating, I said immediately, Monsignor, I already know how to hear confessions. So, this is not just an important qualification for the ordained ministry. This is important for all the baptized. Let's face it, we do a lot of strange stuff. We don't eat meat on Fridays during Lent. People will ask us why we do this. We better have an answer. And it would be really helpful if it was an informed and interesting answer. Why do you people have to go to church on Sunday? It's important that we have an intelligent, factual, and interesting answer. Why we do what we do is intimately related to our status in baptism as a kingdom of priests, a holy people, a priestly people, a people set apart. And so we must be interesting. Yeah. Any questions? Anything you've always wanted to know about what priests are really up to? And, but we're afraid to ask. <laughs> Somebody answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, go ahead. You mean... I said it all? Everybody's satisfied? Wow. God, I'm good. Woo. Is that thing still on? It is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's 8 o'clock. We're going to take a break. And um, I think we should take a break. <laughs>